Welcome to We Are North Texas, a podcast brought to you by the University of North Texas system that focuses on innovation, compassion, ideas, and accomplishments in our home region of Dallas-Fort Worth. The UNT system is the only university system based in DFW and includes the University of North Texas, UNT Health Science Center, and UNT Dallas. With our heart in North Texas, we transform lives and create economic opportunity through education. Welcome to the We Are North Texas podcast. I'm Paul Corliss, Chief Communications Officer for the University of North Texas System. And we have one of our good friends from Dallas here, Dale Petrosky, President and CEO of the Dallas Regional Chamber, joining us. Dale is a great supporter of the UNT system. Our Chancellor, Lisa Rose, on the board. Uh, Dale, how are you guys holding up the last three months? Pretty unusual time for, for a chamber, I imagine, or for anybody. Yeah, well, first of all, Paul, hello, and, and great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're going to look back on this as a moment in time, right? And uh, it's been uh, it's been challenging, but we've uh, we pivoted. You know, we we have a certain body of work, and on March 13th, when all this started coming down, we got together with the senior team, and we figured out that we wanted to have just two teams at the chamber now: communications and member engagement. So we wanted to do a lot of communicating to our members and we wanted to stay close to them so that we could we could be of service to them in the best way possible. So we started a, for, for lack of a better word, a fast-paced newsroom. Uh, we had a lot of good writers on the staff who were former journalists and they began uh, doing stories. They, we have an editorial meeting every morning. They do stories on best practices of companies during this time or the philanthropic work that they're doing doing during this time. Uh, and that goes up on our website, and we send it out through social media. We're also doing a lot more virtual meetings. We've had meetings, for example, with Senator Cornyn when the CARES Act came out, uh, James Huffines and Brett Ryan. Brett Ryan, of course, a, a big UNT alum. Yes, indeed. And our former board chair. Former <laughs> chair, and, and they, they were running the uh, governors and lieutenant governors uh, reopen strike forces and so we wanted to hear from them we've had mark cuban on we've had um, uh, ray washburn on so lots of programming for folks uh, next week actually we have uh, the secretary of labor scalia uh, will be on to talk about labor issues and uh, just a lot of stuff going on so so the first thing was to communicate 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 collaborate 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 and be close to our members the second phase of this paul was what we call responsible return to work. What we realized is a lot of employers wanted to set the stage for coming back into the office. They didn't know how to do that. We've never done this before. So, you know, how? what about the physical distancing? What about masks? What about the hand sanitizer? Uh, all those issues so that they would not be liable and so that their folks could be safe to come back and feel safe coming back. Uh, I should say employees and customers in some cases. So we did a series on that and our website has a lot of information for employers and employees on the responsible return to work. Now we're going into phase three, which is, um, and we've just done a survey of our members and it looks like what they're most interested in is how do we virtually sell now? How do we get new customers, uh, even though we can't go out and meet people and, and prospect them that way? Uh, what about the culture of our organization working from home? Does that dissipate in some way? Um, and also, uh, what about the mental health of our employees? Uh, some of whom, you know, you know, uh, the days get long and you feel a little bit disconnected from things. So that's probably going to be our next program of work. So we've done a lot of work in those areas that we never thought we'd ever have to do. Uh, and on top of that is, of course, all the uh, recent uh, events re regarding uh, racial equity uh, and we have really pivoted in that way too we've just decided to create a new board level council on diversity equity and inclusion we had a big executive committee meeting about that uh, uh, this week and uh, we're also going to hire a new senior vice president for diversity equity and inclusion so that there's a sense of permanence to this and that everything we do is look looked at through the prism of both the board committee as well as our senior vice president. When you're in a time like this that is so unusual and so busy, um, you know, your, your career has been, been amazing in the places you've been in from the White House to National Geographic to, to working in baseball. 
you've seen so many things when you're in a crisis like this or multiple crises do you do you get charged up do you get energized by that what what is your personality with that absolutely in fact i felt a little bit guilty early on during covid by telling people this is exhilarating <laughs> and it's exhilarating simply because there's no room for failure and there's no room for inaction you've got to act and you've got to your, your senses are always heightened and and there's a lot of collaboration there's collaborating with your senior team there's collaborating with the community leaders there's collaborating with uh, organizations that are somewhat like you uh, in order to do the best kinds of things and uh, because it's so new it's like blazing a new trail or or going to a new city for the first time everything seems fresh and new and the old routines don't matter anymore you've got to figure out a new way uh, to do things uh, for the moment and uh, and so yeah that is my personality what, what do you think the Dallas area has done done well as it relates to coronavirus and where are maybe some some areas where we can improve well I think uh, in the big picture we've, we've done a very good job of containing the virus uh, I think compared to most cities like New York and, and the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, Dallas has had very few uh, cases relative to the population. And so I think we've done a really good job at that. Now, having said that, now that Memorial Day has come and people were sort of being given the opportunity to go outside and do things again, I think they're a little bit lax about it right now. I think people are uh, feeling like we're back to normal, and we're not back to normal as it, as as the new numbers indicate. Uh, right, right. First right. day over 400 cases, I think. Right. We're seeing spike now because people just aren't as careful about social distancing or wearing masks and things like that. So I think uh, we knew that the, once it opened up a little bit, there was going to be a little bit of uh, a spike, and then maybe bring it down. And you know, there's going to be a management piece to this that's going to have to happen by our officials now. And you can see it with the governor now working with the county uh, judges and figuring out what they can do and, and, and giving them power to do some things uh, that maybe in the past they didn't have. So it's, it's an interesting time for sure. It is. We had uh, Judge Jenkins and, and Dr. Huang on uh, last week and um, Kind of pr prior to the these spikes, and it's it's interesting now as we see. I think in Bear County, there's there's going to be some some tighter restrictions related to masks, and it looks like they, that may be coming here. Um, kind of leads me into the the next topic I wanted to hit with you, which is um, your say yes to Dallas initiative and Emmett Smith's role. But to just set the table for that initiative, to for you to talk about that, can can you share perspective on how the chamber views uh, following the the science? versus we've got to have an open economy or everybody's going to gonna, gonna go hungry at some point. It's a real balance. Uh, you know, for every person who has passed away, unfortunately, uh, tragically from COVID, 400 people have lost their jobs. Wow, wow, that's for, an amazing for, stat. For every death, 400 people have lost their jobs. And so, you know, we, we have to think about both sides of it. And certainly it's safety first, but I think there was a feeling uh, in the business community that the epidemia, epidemiologists were talking into the ear of public officials, but nobody on the other side was talking into the ear of public officials. Uh, clearly, we needed to shut things down to get control of this thing. We didn't know much about it uh, and, and wanted to do, do the least amount of damage as possible from a, from a um, health standpoint before we opened up. And now that we've opened up, um, we still need to be very guarded and very careful. But I think the feeling is we've got to get back to life a little bit here or else there's not going to be much left uh, in terms of livelihoods. Well, and and, and perfect setup for, for talking about what is the, the chamber doing to help those of, you know, those that have lost their jobs or, yeah. or folks that may be looking for a job in another market. You know, Paul, you talked early on about uh, you know, how it, how it was all fresh and new, and, and I use the word exhilarating. One of the most uh, exciting things that we did early on, uh, we were having a meeting with uh, Downtown Dallas, Inc., and the Dallas Citizens Council and Visit Dallas, sort of sister organizations to ours, 
And we said, what can we do right now? This is like in the first or second week. Right. And they said, you know, it'd be great to have a jobs website to help people who have lost their jobs. Well, we at the Dallas Regional Chamber probably were in the best position to put together a, a jobs website because we have the most resources and, and we have people who do those kinds of things. And so we did that. <clears throat> we put together a jobs website for all the folks who are through no fault of their own, lost their jobs. They just happened to be in the wrong industry at the wrong time. Right. You know, great industries, airlines, uh, restaurants, hotels, sports. Uh, and, and higher and, ed, too. We've, we've and, had and, and higher ed, exactly. Many challenges. And so so what we did is there, there are a number of industries hiring grocery stores, uh, warehouses, uh, pharmacies, so people who are working in one of the industries where the jobs were down would go to our website and look for a job in an area that was hiring. And so we were able to connect people to folks who were actually were hiring at that time and try to mitigate some of the damage. And I just saw some numbers yesterday. I think it's something like 30,000 people now have been to that website and have looked at a total of 190,000 different jo 190, jobs, jobs you know, in, in total. So it's, it's had a great effect, and that all started with the collaboration with the Visit Dallas, Downtown Dallas, Inc., and the, and the Dallas Citizens Council. And, and, and Emmett Smith is helping as a spokesperson for the initiative? How, how did that relationship come about? Yeah, I, call, I called Emmett and asked if he would be willing to do it, and it didn't take him but uh, half a second to say, yes, I want to help. And so uh, he did some public service ads for TV and radio, and uh, of course, they're on billboards around town. And uh, I think it's been a it's been a great thing for it's. Of course, Emmett Smith will always draw attention, uh, but the fact that he's helping, I think people really enjoy that too. No, it's it's nice to have a face with with the initiative. I think. Uh, how do you think workforce is is going to change as we move forward? Obviously. You know, we're, we at, at the UNT system are going to sort of operate in a hybrid model if, if things go well this fall. I would think every industry is, is going to change in some capacity. What, what, what are you and your folks seeing in the future? Well, I'd say short term, what we're seeing for most uh, companies in Dallas is that they're being uh, relatively cautious. Uh, they are being very flexible about letting people go back to work you and me, uh, if we want to, or if they'd rather stay home and work from home. I think we figured out that we can work virtually pretty well, uh, especially with folks that you've worked with a lot in the past. You have a trust built with them already. Um, for the long term, though, uh, you know, we can't, we can't work like that forever because, uh, you know, sales need to be made. You know, we need to, we need to start opening up restaurants. We started to need to open up hotels and other things like that. And so I don't have a crystal ball about what the future looks like. I, I would just say that um, I think folks right now are being somewhat cautious about uh, making people go back to work. I think there, there are a lot of issues involved, child care issues or right. taking care of elderly parents, and all those kinds of things that um, we weren't even thinking about six months ago. But, uh, but I think People, I think people have handled it really well in terms of um, being humane and compassionate about their employees. We have uh, at University of North Texas system and in our, in our institutions have a, a great partnership and relationship with, uh, with the Dallas Regional Chamber. And uh, I, I believe your, your, your special assistant, uh, Barrett Cole, is a, is a UNT alum. We, we used to uh, interact with her quite a bit in the president's office at UNT. Young people like Barrett that are just getting out of college, where would you advise them to look for, for, for jobs? What industries are going to, to, to grow through these, these changes that we're seeing? Well, if they're all like Barrett, I would encourage them to apply to the Dallas region. <laughs> <laughs> she is awesome, yes. As you know, she was student body president at, uh, at UNT. And she's a superstar. I mean, really, you, you go a long way to find another person as capable as Barrett Cole. And uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to have her at my side because she makes my life so much easier and so much more efficient. I'm a lot more productive with her than anybody I've ever been with. So I really... That's uh, a great compliment. If you're turning out UNT grads like Barrett... <laughs>
that, that, that is a fantastic thing. We also have another one here. Jessica Hare is our senior vice president for uh, talent attraction and our leadership programs. And she got her master's from, from UNT. Oh, so fantastic. we have a couple. But yeah, I would, I would encourage them again. Please look look to us first if you're if you're looking for an interesting job and a job that makes a difference in our community, but uh, but obviously you know technology jobs are always always big nursing you know any kind of any kind of health job any kind of technology job uh, are, are really important. But you know there's there's jobs across the board marketing uh, communications uh, those fields are critical. Uh, as we go forward here, and you realize that um, um, you know not everybody can communicate, and if you have the skills to communicate, then I think you have a great chance of helping your organization and having a pretty great career too. Where are you guys going to focus your efforts? As as you know, let's let's fast forward to whenever a vaccine is available, and then we really kind of get back to normal. Obviously, things things may be a little bit different with with more people working remotely, but as far as you know, getting this economy back to the, the, the machine and monster that it really was is one of the world's really most robust and strong economies. Where, where do you guys focus your efforts, you know, in the longer term future? Well, we're just finishing up a five year strategic plan now. Uh, it was the, what the a time last, to do that. <laughs> the last five years. And we, we were working before all of this on the next five year strategic plan, which will be announced in January and last through December of 2025. And so we had it kind of in the bank. It was set to go. And then all this happened. And then all the all the um, civil unrest happened. And we're going to crack it open now and look at it again through through the lens of both COVID and uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. And so as we look to the future, by the way, I think Dallas's future is very bright for uh, a simple reason. Uh, uh, on top of the advantages we already have that we know, which is the central location, great quality of life, the cost of living here compared to the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, lots of Fortune 500 companies here, lots of talent here. That's why uh, great tax system for businesses, very favorable to, to businesses. So there's a lot of reasons people want to come here already. And I'll add one more after all this settles down, and that's going to be a lack of density because of all the major top 10 markets in the United States, we're the least dense. Uh, I'll give you one stat, which will tell you what I mean. In New York, they have 29,000 people per square mile. In Dallas, we have 4,000 people per square mile. Wow, that's, that's an amazing stat. <laughs> so people that are willing to move out of New York uh, or want to move out of New York are gonna be looking not for something like New York, they're gonna be looking for something that's spread out and, and uh, much more livable. And if another pandemic were to come, it wouldn't be nearly as disastrous for a city like Dallas as it would be for New York. I think also a lot of companies are looking for their second headquarters to mitigate the risk. So uh, they might be looking uh, like, like uh, Amazon was to have a couple of different headquarters, different places. I think we'll be the beneficiaries of that as well because of our airports and our transportation system. So. Uh, I wanted to, to, to get into leadership with you a little bit. You, you worked, you started early in your career with, with, the, with President Reagan in the White House. I mean, one of the greatest leaders our country's ever seen. So uh, your perspective is, is one that I think would be in, enlightening. Um, who do you think has done a good job leading locally or, or, or elsewhere? Um, and, and where do you think that, that leadership could be better? Yeah, I think that... Um I think the governor actually has done a good job of leading. You know, he's in a tight he's in a tight spot. He's a, he's running a major state. It's a very conservative state, um, and he's got a White House breathing down his neck. You know, to do certain things, uh, and yet I think he has threaded the needle uh, in terms of safety and really trying to look out for the best interests of all the citizens of the state. And and back to our earlier conversation about. It can't be all one or the other, you right. know. Certainly, safety is really important. Health is really important. Uh, the economy is really important too. And and so, you know, some governors I think have been a, a very heavy on one side and not the other. 
I think our governor has been pretty balanced about it, and I really applaud him for his leadership uh, during this time. I think Clay Jenkins has done a really good job of uh, getting the word out about, you know, um, staying safe, uh, promoting policies that would um, um, let people know what they should be doing in terms of physical distancing and wearing masks and all those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, Clay doesn't necessarily have the economy portfolio in his in his in his portfolio, uh, but um, he's done a good job of telling us about the risks so that we can at least get through this and then come out the other end and, and get stronger again. No, it's 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 been interesting to to watch you know so many step up uh, and, and and help. You know, and it, it just such a, a time where things change so rapidly. It's it's like, you know, every day it's different. And then, of course, uh, you know, we've had had racial tension in the country. Um, did you see any of the protests? Did you make it out to any of the protests? I know your your office is downtown. I don't know where you live. What 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 have been your experience there? You know, I, I did not see the protests. The, the week of the protests, we allowed people to work from home that week. We just didn't want to get caught up in all of that. Sure. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot about them, you know, and I, I know that most of them were peaceful. And, um, you know, and I certainly, uh, uh, you know, applaud people for coming out and peacefully demonstrating against something that's so wrong as police brutality, you know, and racial injustice. Uh, so so I, I know they, they weren't all peaceful. But I think the ones who are peacefully protesting uh, are, should be um, should be applauded. Well, a, a, a lighter topic that I had to address before uh, we let you go today, because uh, I don't know if our listeners know, but you uh, you ran the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. You were also the head of uh, uh, marketing and, and community relations, I believe, for the Texas Rangers. And man, those of us that are baseball fans are hurting right now. What what the heck is going on with the, with, with the inability to reach a labor agreement here? Yeah, it's a hard one, you know, and it's going to be an unusual season in any case, right? I mean, even if they play, they'll play 76 or 80 games. Uh, they're talking about three divisions, uh, the Rangers being in with the Dodgers and Giants and Diamondbacks. I mean, they're going to make them all as geographically close as possible. Um, it's just going to be, even if they do play, it's going to be a very, very unusual season. And so I don't know what's going to happen really, Paul. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that the players would not take 75% of their pay for playing 50% of their games. To me, that sounds like a heck of a deal. It's like a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> and so I mean, they must feel like they've got leverage, I guess, but, uh, but it, you know, if they, they truly want to do what's best for the sport and uh, bring the country back to some form of normalcy. It seems like they should be accepting that kind of a deal. I also believe, I also saw recently that people, the sport that people are missing the most is baseball right now. And so that's, that's, that's a good thing for the fans, but I think it gives those players and those owners a special responsibility to come to some sort of an agreement so they can get started and, and uh, at least give us a half a season. Yeah, even without fans, I think it's, it's just hard to, to, to think of a summer without baseball. It's something that we, we those, that have, uh, those of us that like the game take comfort in. Yeah. Uh, we'll let you go here, Dale, with, with one more question. And uh, I think it's an interesting one to get your perspective on because you've had such an interesting and, and diverse career. And we've had you on before and we've talked about some of the things you learned in your various stops. But what have what have you learned through everything that's happened these past three four months, and and what will you take with you as a leader of a major organization moving forward? Yeah, I think, wow, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I've learned that uh, people are pretty resilient, and I've learned that uh, you can during a crisis you get even closer to your, to your team. Uh, we make decisions around here very collaboratively. I have a senior staff meeting every morning for one hour with uh, 14, 15 of my, se of my team, and they're the senior leaders here. And we, you know, I'll throw out ideas. I, I don't have, I'll be the first to admit, I don't have all the answers, you know, uh, but I'll have an idea 
and I'll throw the idea on the table and together we'll shape it and we'll come out with a, a much better idea uh, through the help of, of all the senior leadership here. So I think you start to see by doing that every day. In the past, we had a staff, senior staff meeting one hour a week, but I think I'm going to go to one hour a day from now on because I think we're there's so much happening here. We need to pass information back and forth so everybody's in the loop on things. But I think it's also better. We come up with better decisions by having uh, more voices at the table, more perspectives, more diversity, uh, which I think is really a good thing for the chamber. It's probably a good thing for a lot of organizations. And I think what we've seen is because we can do virtual meetings like this um, now, uh, you could do that pretty easily going forward too, and uh, not as not as hard as getting people to the table every morning at the, at a certain time. You know, oh, I'm I'm with you there. Well, we we appreciate everything that the chamber does. I think anytime uh, Lisa Rowe, our chancellor, meets with with you and other board members, she comes in with with some great ideas or some some shared experiences that we can learn from and. Uh, we just appreciate that role and appreciate the partnership. Uh, Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. And to our listeners, thanks for listening to the We Are North Texas podcast. I'm Paul Corliss, and we'll talk to you soon. Paul, thank you. UNT World is a special place filled with talented and dedicated students, faculty, and staff that do amazing things every day. With our heart in North Texas, we transform lives and create economic opportunity through education. We are North Texas. I'm Paul Corliss. Talk to you soon.